So you've heard me say it again and again because it's so cool. We get to see four people get baptized today. Let's hear it for them. So primarily, we are here to celebrate God's work in Randy's life, in Bryce's life, in Bob's life, in Sherry's life, that that Jesus died on the cross and through his death, he has washed away all of their sins and Jesus rose from the dead for each one of them and they can have hope and confidence that just as surely as Jesus rose from the dead, Jesus will raise each one of you from the dead. But we're here secondarily that each one of us vicariously who believe in the same gospel can celebrate our own faith today. And I want to just encourage you that as you watch them go under the water, think to yourself, Jesus died for my sin too. And think to yourself, Jesus' death washes away all of my sin just as surely as it washes away all of theirs. And when we pull them out of the water, yes, we will pull them out of the water, you think to yourself, and Jesus rose again for me just as much, and I am going to live after I die because of Jesus. And so let this be a celebration for you, for your faith. Let this be a celebration of the gospel for each one of us who believe. And then finally, let this be a moment that we never forget as a church that we walk in and we look up and we see our mission, why we're here, that we're here to honor God by making more disciples of Jesus Christ. What you are going to see in a little bit with four people being baptized is a picture of what it looks like when we are actually living out that mission. It's not the only picture, but it's a really beautiful, powerful one. And we are hoping and trusting and believing by faith. And a lot of what we are doing as a church is so that days like today are just an ordinary Sunday in the life of living hope. And so I just hope and pray that you are encouraged, that we as a church are encouraged, and we believe on God that God is going to draw many people to faith, that just as we need the gospel of Jesus Christ to work in our lives, there are thousands of people in our community that need the gospel and need Jesus just as much, and we want to live for them as much as we live for people who are in this church. And so as part of that, We are, as a step of faith, starting a new tradition. So you're going to see every person getting baptized is getting a t-shirt that we gave them to be baptized in. And these are the first of many that we will be making. And I want you to look at this shirt. It has 1 Peter 1, 3, which is a precious verse for us that he has given us to be new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus that this is what we're celebrating as they're being baptized today. And so I want to just take a minute to talk to you about that beautiful verse, which is dear to us, because that's where we get the name of the church from, and what it means to be baptized, what we're celebrating in their lives, what we're celebrating in our lives, and what we're celebrating as a church. So look on the screen behind me, open up a Bible or your phone to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm also going to... um, Finish off with verse 4, which is also powerful to help us understand. And this is what it says. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what blessed is, this is an expression of thanks. Thank you, God. We are so grateful. This is an expression of worship. That's when you say blessed be. You're worshiping. Well, that begs the question, what are we worshiping for? What are we thankful for? What has God done that's such a big deal that we overcome, we're overcome with thanks and with worship? Glad you asked. According to his great mercy. And so we are grateful for the mercy of God. So when they come forward to be baptized, we're not celebrating that, Randy, you've achieved such a level of spiritual maturity, we're just all standing in awe of you. You're pretty cool. But that's not what we're celebrating. We're celebrating that the mercy and grace of God has come into Bob's life. 
That's what we're celebrating. And into Randy's and into Bryce's, that God has been good. What is mercy? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. It's getting better than what you deserve. And that's the gospel. The gospel is not something we earn or deserve or we make happen. It's something God gives us as a gift. So we are grateful. We worship God for the mercy of God. He has caused us to be born again. And so he has caused us. This is the work of God we celebrate. And to be born again, this is such a cool phrase. You've probably heard this before. And what it means, it means to be born, not just again, but born anew or to be made new. And so what does that look like? I don't know if you have a picture of the two cars. So put up the Fiero on there if you've got that, or maybe you don't. Okay, oh, it's up behind me. Good. I'm just kind of blind and not looking. Okay, I want you to imagine that you have an old, rusted out 1984 Pontiac Fiero that has been sitting in your backyard for 25 years. It is a hunk of junk. The engine is gone. All the tires are, are blown out. Like, it's rust out. It's just gross. There's no way this thing is going to work. Not only is it worthless, it's more than worthless. Like, you've got to pay someone to get rid of this hunk of junk. Okay, then I want you to imagine that someone comes and says, I want to make a trade. I want to trade your 1984 Pontiac Fiero for this. A brand new Chevy Corvette ZR1. And all the guys are like, yes. Like, what kind of a trade is that? Like, that is a really cool trade because this is an awesome car. It works. It works really well. It's valuable versus the other one is worthless. Like, it is so cool that you get psyched over it. And so this is a picture of what it means to be born again, to be made new, that God has taken your faith, which is like Honestly, a rusted out 1984 Pontiac Fiero that is just dead weight. And he's made it into a brand new Chevy Corvette that is really cool, really valuable, really fast, and runs really great. That's what God has done for you spiritually. So when we say you are born again, you are made new. That is what we're celebrating. So he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Now, here are the words that are, you know, dear to us because that's the name of our church. But what I love about living hope is actually the living that has, serves two functions in this phrase. So the first thing is living, it, it helps you understand what kind of hope it is. And so this is opposed to a dead hope. So if you have a dead hope, that's a hope in something that's dead. It's not going to happen. It's a foolish hope. It's a hope that isn't going to accomplish anything. And so it's useless and foolish. But a living hope, which is the opposite of that, is something that is real. It's something that is alive. It's something that's going to happen. It's something you know you can count on. So the second thing, it is a living hope in living. And so living is also the object or what we are hoping in. That we aren't hoping in just a Chevy Corvette ZR1. We are hoping in living, in eternal life that we will have through Christ. That's what we are hoping in. That's the gift. That is the source. And that's the object of the living hope. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so the resurrection of Christ, not only this is why we believe, why our hope is living, that we know that there's life after death because Jesus rose again. This is also how we know what our hope is, that we have the same hope in the resurrection of Jesus, that just as surely as Jesus rose from the dead, he will raise you from the dead and you will have eternal life with Jesus. Now, where? Where is that eternal life going to be? Glad you asked. This is why verse 4 matters. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. So in the Old Testament, God's people had an inheritance. The inheritance was the promised land, the land of Israel. But there's a problem. 
You see, that promised land was the land where they were to experience God's blessings, where they were to worship God, where they were to all be together as the people of God, where just all the produce and the protection and all the blessings of God would flow through that inheritance of the promised land. But the problem was they blew it. It perished. They lost the promised land. You know why? Because they defiled the promised land. And that hope and that inheritance faded away and they lost it. So your inheritance is different. Your inheritance you can never lose. Your inheritance cannot be defiled. No matter how much we try to defile it with our sin, even after we come to faith in Christ, and it's a hope that will never fade away. Why is that? Because it's kept in heaven for you. Well, why can't I have it now? Why is it kept in heaven? It's kept in heaven so we won't blow it, so we won't destroy it. And it's kept in heaven because the inheritance is heaven. That's what we're hoping in. That because of Jesus, we really believe Jesus died on the cross. He cleansed all of our sins. That we're right before God, not because of us. And that he rose again. And that just as surely as Jesus rose from the dead, you and I who believe will be risen by Jesus from the dead. We will stand in heaven to see God face to face. And we will live forever and ever and ever. And I don't think we get nearly excited enough about that. That's the gospel. That sounds like really good news to me. How about you? And so this is what these four are believing in. So I want to invite each of them to come forward one by one. So they're going to start by each of them are going to share their testimony. They're going to answer the question, how did you come to believe in Jesus and why do you want to be baptized? And then after they share, we're going to baptize them in the same order. So Randy, you're first. So I want to invite you to come forward. Let's give them a round of applause. going to pull my phone up as I've been taking notes and retaking notes and changing my notes and then changing them over again every night. So I'll probably have to glance down from time to time. I promise I'm not checking any fantasy scores or lineups. <laughs> um, well, honestly, I, uh, I came to believe in Jesus kind of in a very roundabout way. Uh, so I was someone who was baptized as a kid, brought up, you know, for the first eight or nine years or so, really in the church every Sunday, but it was very much what folks are used to kind of picturing as a not very friendly church, let's say folks, you know, dressed to the nines, the whole thing, um, was deeply involved and really brought up a lot throughout my childhood um, by my grandparents, alternately. My mother and father worked a lot, um, so I spent a lot of time with them, and especially spent a lot of time with my mother's father, my you know, maternal grandfather, and when I was younger, would ask him all kinds of questions. We would talk about God, we'd talk about things in the Bible as I read through it as a kid, and he would talk to me very much so like I was an adult on his level, which was incredible for, you know, a young child. And he would sit and explain happily everything to me, and I really came to have a good understanding of the Bible and how things work. Um, unfortunately, around 10, we had moved to Florida, and it turned out he, uh, he was dying. And he eventually died in Dallas. Away from all of us. So it really is more of a story of two grandfathers and two very different lives that both led to Jesus. This grandfather had a very long story, bad history, unfortunately, but God and Jesus saw fit to save him. <laughs> and give me that time with him. I think, to lead me eventually down this path. Um, so around 11, he died. Long story short. And uh, sent me in a spin as an 11-year-old kid whose primary male role model just dropped dead. 
Um, from that point forward, I really didn't want much of anything to do with it. I didn't understand, you know, obviously, why such a thing would happen. And uh, very honestly, I probably blame most of that on God. You know, the frustration, not understanding why that would happen. And then every summer we started coming back up north and I would spend time with my other grandfather, my other grandmother in the summer for a month or two. Um, and he was a very different person. We didn't have those deep conversations or anything like that, but we would sit out on the back porch and we would watch hummingbirds. He had feeders all over on a property with a bunch of land and just a beautiful, serene setting. And we would just sit and just watch the sunset or try to wait for the hummingbirds. And I always had the hardest time staying still as a kid and I still have a hard time staying still now. Like my inclination is to want to pace as I'm talking to you all. Um, and I never understood how he could sit so still. He was like a statue just waiting for these hummingbirds. And he didn't get upset at the fact that I couldn't manage to sit still like he could, that he would never get to see a hummingbird as long as I was on the back patio. Um, he just sat and just waited. And we just quietly waited until it was time to light a fire that evening or go inside and you know watch a TV show or play a board game and then go to bed. Um, well, one time I finally willed myself enough to stay still and saw a hummingbird for a couple of seconds just before we ended up moving back to New York State. But long story short, his ability to be so still and so calm um, through any kind of turmoil, you know, he eventually ended up getting Louis body dementia. Um, and he, you know, ended up not obviously well as anyone with it would not be. And it took a great many things from him that he enjoyed deeply. He was a, a school bus driver after he had retired for uh, deaf students that went to the deaf school in Rochester. And, uh, Having Louis body dementia robbed him of the one thing that he really got up and drove him every day, but still, that stillness and that, you know, kind of quiet, stoic ability left me completely in awe. Um, and I never understood really where it came from, that, you know, 10, 15 year span of me not, not really carrying any kind of faith, not really having that kind of belief. I, I didn't understand it. I just kind of thought it was an innate thing that he owned. Um, it really took me going through, you know, some, some times where I worked a job, I did things where they made me only see the worst in people. Um, quite frankly, I, I oftentimes dealt with the uglier parts of society and things that people did to each other or things like that. Um, I don't obviously need to get much further into that kind of detail. That's not what this is about, but... In all reality, it, it continued as I was an adult to continue to push me further and further along the path to not, not having that faith. Um, and then, you know, I, I met my wife uh, 14 years ago. And uh, when I met my wife, I was in a place where I didn't have hot water in my apartment. You know, I was scraping money just to pay bills, buying you know, pizza from a place down the road with a guy that I knew just like, hey, here's a buck, give me everything that's left, and they were going to throw it out anyway, so he gave it to me, and that in and of itself was a blessing in a way. But all those things I saw just simply as more, more proof that there wasn't a reason for me to have faith, you know. And then my wife came along in the midst of all that and was always kind and generous and always trying to see the best in people. Um, and it really wasn't until my second grandfather, the one with the stillness on the back porch, died in January that I really came full circle. You know, I, I, my wife had started to kind of plant the seed um, and tried to push me to come to church, you know, and try to push me to do things that maybe weren't in my comfort zone and that I had built up walls and defenses against. Um, and thank God she didn't give up on me to that point as it probably would have been easy to multiple times. Um, as I know, I had my own struggles with all those things and trying to get through all of that. And then over the last year, you know, she had her own struggles health-wise and, you know, more of that ugliness of society impacting our family and things directly. Um, and throughout all of that, I continued every day to, you know, when I could make it to church due to work, to come to church, and somehow every sermon just seemed to be exactly what I was thinking about or struggling with or not sleeping at night before. Uh, 
every time I walked in the door. I don't know how. So finally, in January this year, um, on that path, you know, starting to think about it again, coming to church, and my grandfather from the back patio with the hummingbirds finally passes um, after about two years in the nursing home of just, you know, falling apart like one does with Louis body dementia. And uh, even at the end, he's just as happy as he always could have been, even struggling with it, not knowing, you know, where he was or how to put his socks on or how to feed himself. Um, just happy to see everyone. And then I went to his funeral and I realized, you know, I'm looking around this room and he had been a staple in his church, you know, one of the, the deacons and elders of his church for 40 years. Um, I really came to understand what it was that led him to all that stillness, that stoic behavior. His faith had grounded him in a way that I just couldn't have imagined that being the case. And it really opened my eyes and made me realize, you know, my grandfather when I was young, the way he was able to get through addiction and all sorts of bad things and come back from all of that and build a family and a company and a life for all of us. Um, the way he did that was because he found Jesus and he trusted him and had faith and loved him dearly. The reason my other grandfather was able to do that was he had grown up understanding and he had rock solid faith with which to stand on. It gave him his wife, my grandmother, an amazing lady, and she helped plant him in that fashion, and I was lucky enough to have much the same happen to me. Um, so as I looked around this room and I saw, you know, the hundred or so odd, maybe 200 people packed into this church, you know, you would have thought you were showing up to a good concert. It was standing room only, and I realized that it was his faith that allowed this, um, and that gave him this ability and gave him an ability to touch everyone around him and, you know, be an example for them, not just me. And at that point, you know, I had started to have some conversations with Pastor Jeff and jumped into Alpha to try to round out some of my conversations and some of my thoughts in my head and ask some of the questions that I couldn't or wasn't comfortable asking before. Um, really worked on trying to figure out how I could learn to trust, as that was my main issue, trust that, you know, the Lord had me, I guess. So... Long story short, as I'm sure I'm rambling at this point, I apologize. I'm going to look at my notes here. Um, I came to the decision that I wanted to follow Jesus and God. Um, I had the conversation with Pastor Jeff about what that would look like and maybe how I could learn how to trust. And I've, over the last, what is it, six, seven months now, really spent time going back through thinking praying for the first time in probably 20-something years. Um, I've come to realize that many of the things and the struggles that I fought so hard against and I blamed on, you know, God and was one of those folks that wrung my fist over it really were gifts in their own right. There were things to take away from them, lessons that made me who I am at this moment. And the realization clicked that, you know, all of my time not trusting and Jesus was me fighting against the things that he was trying to use to teach me how to be a better man than I was or how to be more like my grandfather's. Um, and the gift that he had given me with, you know, my wife and my beautiful children, I had somewhat, you know, not put on the pedestal I should have as she helped lead me back to this and it would be impossible without her. Um, so... All that to be said, it was proved to me that my trust was never misplaced. I should have realized and had the same kind of faith my grandfather did. That was why he was able to sit so still. He understood, yes, things may sometimes be difficult. It's only difficult because we need them to be. We're always given that which we need. So, long story short, I uh, said that about seven times now, I'm sorry. But I, at this point, Genuinely, genuinely want to be closer to my Lord, my God. I want to understand better the gift that he gave to us with his sacrifice. Whether or not I feel worthy every moment doesn't matter because he believes it. That's all I have. Thank you.
All right, well, you stay up. Because we want to invite Bryce to come forward and stand with his dad. And Bryce is going to share his testimony. Come on up. Give him a round of applause. My parents thought it would be a good idea if we went to church. I kept, yeah. So why do you like doing it? I like doing it because, I like doing it because I was getting closer to God more and knowing more about God. I want to be baptized because I want to be even closer to God and have a good relationship with God. Because I just want to have a good relationship with God. So something, Bryce, that I really love is how after VBS, how that had a big impact on your life. And you came into my office and you talked to me about your faith in Jesus and what it meant to you. And that was really beautiful. And I'm really proud of you as your pastor. So congratulations. All right. Let's get, give them a round of applause. And Bob Yardman. We'll bring that up. Good morning. My testimony starts with the movie 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And I know, okay, you're thinking, okay, where is he going with this? And other people are probably saying, oh, this is going to be good. So I saw the movie when I was very young, probably about my granddaughter's age, and probably like four or five. And for those of you that haven't seen the movie or don't remember, at the end, Captain Nemo goes back to his island. It's being overrun with soldiers, and he sets off a bomb, and um, he gets shot. And at the end, you know, the submarine goes down, and I thought, wow, you know, what a cool movie. So the next day, as a little boy, I was playing, and all of a sudden, like a uh, ton of bricks, I realized, you know, oh my gosh, Captain Nemo died. And then um, I realized I realized, hey, someday I'm going to die. My parents are going to die. And obviously, as you can imagine, I got very upset. My mother and father came to me and asked me what was wrong. And I told them, and they're like, well, you know, it's, it's not going to happen for a very long time. You're very little. It's you're very young. You have a whole life ahead of yourself, and we're going to be around for a long time. And um, my parents were not very religious. My father was born from Ukrainian immigrants that were EJ workers. And um, he technically was uh, Russian Orthodox, but he never went to church. He rarely ever spoke of God other than maybe in passing. My mother was a Methodist, but she didn't go to church regularly. Um, they would occasionally talk about God and Jesus, but it wasn't something where it was in our house every day. I mean, there was Bibles in the house, and I was always a curious and liked to read, and I would occasionally crack open a Bible, and I think somebody gave me as a gift a children's Bible, 
Um, other times at like a hospital, or whatever, I would see a children's Bible and I would, you know, open it up. But we were not church going people. Um, I mean, I would pick up things here and there. I have an older brother who married into a uh, family that was very deep in the Catholic Church, and uh, I was his ring bearer. So my first exposure to going to church was going to St. Ambrose um, as a non-practicing Catholic, and that was a little bit traumatic because obviously, as you know, there's a lot of ritual in the Catholic Mass, and literally, you know, you're sitting there trying to do what everyone else does and just try to fit in so you don't look like a complete knucklehead. Um, and that would be occasional, you know, throughout the years we would go, I would go with my brother and his wife and his family, we would go to, you know, either midnight mass or we would go to an Easter service intermittently, but not all the time. Um, fast forward about 10 years and my father passed away. Um, I was... Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> As I said, I was about 13 years old. Um, my father was a bit older. He had me late in life. He was uh, in his 50s when I was born. Um, it was his second marriage. It was also my mother's second marriage. Um, so my father uh, was a retired police officer for Endicott. And um, spent... Um, he spent a great deal of time with me during the summers, and also my mother um, went back to work. So um, he had a very big part in my life. Um, and as you can imagine, and as you can uh, still see, um, it was very devastating. Um, and... Um, After he had passed, of course, everyone rallied around me. My mother, my uh, older brother and sister, um, were from my, who were from my mother's first marriage, um, you know, all tried to comfort me. And um, as best as they tried, nothing really that they said or did really, really helped. But I'll tell you what did help. Um, for the first time in my life, I felt something um, that was basically lifting me up. And um, I believe that it was God reaching out. And from there on out, um, whenever I had like the darkest times of my life, that hand has always been there. Um, and I believe it was the Spirit of God that was holding me up when nobody else or nothing else could uh, do that, not even myself or any of my family. So, moving on, I, um, you know, made it through high school and college and met my wife, and uh, her family was very much involved in church, 
and uh, her grandfather, who uh, Just give me one sec. Her grandfather, uh, Mark Avery, was a man of uh, very, oh, thank you. A man of tremendous faith. And, um, uh, a man of tremendous faith, and uh, the only grandparent. Um, him and his wife, maybe. Um, they were the only uh, grandparents I ever knew um, because both my father's and mother's grandparents passed away when I was basically just had been born. So, um, but as I said, he was a tremendous man of faith, salt of the earth, and he really inspired me in a lot of ways to really accept Jesus into my life. Um, and I guess you're asking, okay, well, why didn't you ever get baptized? Well, um, we could just never find a church that really felt as welcoming and comforting and comfortable as this one. Um, Throughout the years growing up, we would go to different churches, and I won't say that they were bad, they just weren't right for us. I mean, we went to, it was almost like the Goldilocks thing, where, you know, one is too big and just too impersonal. I remember we, my wife and I, reached out to the, uh, the pastor and asked if, you know, if we could have some time with him, and his response literally was after a service, was, I, I, I'm too busy, I don't have time for you. And that was just so discouraging. And um, not too long after that, I think we, we left that church and, and didn't go for a while. And then we would try a different one. And uh, that one did not seem to be right for us either. So through no fault of their own or anything like that, it's not like they were doing anything wrong. It just, it just wasn't a good fit. Um, so... So to move it along and to not break down into tears again and cry ugly, um, my wife started working here at the preschool about a year ago, and uh, our granddaughter was also going as well. And uh, my younger son actually went here um, over 20 years ago. So we were at least familiar with the preschool. So anyway... Um, the first year that my granddaughter went, uh, my wife was pretty involved with a lot of the uh, activities and stuff, and so they invited her to interview, and she got hired as an assistant teacher last year. And I remember one day, um, she came home, and she was just really excited, and she's like, oh, we got to go to service. And I said, okay. And she's like, I met the pastor today, and he's really, really, really nice. You'll really like him. And so I went to service, and she was right. I mean, Jeff is awesome, and um, that's one of the reasons, and probably one of the biggest reasons why um, that I've decided to go through my baptism today is because it just feels like I'm home. So, thank you. Sherry Jacobs.
I write better than I speak, so I wrote it out in advance. Good morning, friends. My name is Sherry Jacobs, and my faith journey started early. My birth family is pretty dysfunctional. My birth mother, Maud, left me with her mother, my grandmother, when I was only 18 months old. And I only ever saw her one other time in my life when I was four. And then she just disappeared. So I lived with my grandmother until she died when I was six. My mother's sister, Louise, took me to live with her and her husband, Eddie, and they later adopted me. Although none of the adults in my life went to church, they felt that I should go to church. So my grandmother sent me to the Methodist church in our little town of Wyalusing with a neighboring family. And then when I moved to live with my adopted parents in New Milford, they sent me to a small rural Baptist church, just dropping me off Sunday morning. And here is where I learned about the saving grace and love of Jesus for all of us. The summer that I was seven years old, a vacation Bible school was held at the church, and the teachers taught us about Jesus and salvation. The reason why we should have a VBS, right? Since I had no other way to get to VBS, the kindly older pastor, Carl Egley, would pick me up at my house and drive me to VBS. On one such trip, he asked if I had invited Jesus to be my savior. And I said, no, but I would like to. So he pulled off to the side of the road and I prayed the prayer, as Pastor Jeff calls it, and invited Jesus to be my Lord and savior. My faith grew over the years attending the church until I reached the age of 15 when the strict rules, no dancing, no movies, no makeup, didn't make sense to me, and the church had no answers as to why these rules existed that made any sense to me, so I left. I spent my college years reading about other belief systems, looking for answers. Although Paul and I were married at his childhood church, Conklin Presbyterian, I wasn't really back in the faith. We moved a couple of times following his job, and then moved back to Conklin, and I started going to Conklin Presbyterian Church. By this time, our son Nathan had been born, and I realized that Jesus was who and what I believed in, because a miracle like our baby could only come from God. Over the years, I experienced several instances where God showed me that he is real, and he is here for me. One was a horrific car accident my family and I were in on our way to a Florida vacation. And only God could have given me the peace that I felt in the middle of that terrifying experience. God has always been my, my lifeline and sometimes the only stability I had growing up. So after I was saved as a little girl, I asked if I had been baptized. There was a picture of me in what appeared to be a christening gown but no baptismal certificate or anything like that. And my adoptive mother said, well, yeah, you were baptized in the Episcopalian church, which made no sense uh, to, because our family, for our family, because they were all Baptist. And the Baptist church does not perform infant baptisms, only infant dedications. But she was sure it had happened. So for years, I took, her, took it at her word that I was baptized, but it was never really settled for me. I think the Holy Spirit was, was prodding me. And in retrospect, my adoptive mother was not a well-educated or a churched woman, and she may not have understood the difference between an infant dedication and a baptism. And since she and my birth mother, who was her younger sister, disliked each other intensely, it's not probable that Louise would have been present at the ceremony to witness it firsthand. All of this background to, to say I've never really been sure that I was baptized because I only had family hearsay as proof. And as my faith has grown, it has become more and more important to me to know that I am baptized in obedience to Jesus' command. So today I want to publicly declare that Jesus is my Lord and Savior and that I identify with his death and resurrection, knowing that as he rose from the dead, so too shall all we who believe. Thank you for listening to my story. All right, I want to invite Nate, my partner, forward. Um, we are going to invite them in the same order, one at a time, uh, to come forward. And, um, and then, Jamie, can you come forward and help be my assistant? Thank you. Um, so, and then as they go under the water, 
what they are saying to God, to themselves, and to you is that they believe that Jesus died on the cross for him, for them, and that their, his death on the cross washes away all of their sins. And when they come up out of the water, what they're saying to God, to you, and to themselves is they believe Jesus rose again for them. And so, Randy, you get to be first. I we'll invite you to come forward. And turn around. Randy, is it your desire to identify with Jesus in his death and resurrection through your baptism today? If so, say I do. I do. Okay, so Bryce, is it your desire to identify with Jesus in his death and resurrection through your baptism? To say, through your baptism, Jesus died for me and rose again for me. If so, see, I do. I do. All right. All right, I want to invite Bob Yardman to come forward. And family and friends, so Andrea and Aurora. And okay. All right. So, Bob, is it your desire to identify with Jesus in his death and resurrection through your baptism? If so, say, I do. I do. So Sherry Jacobs, come on in. Um, family Paul and Amanda and Megan and Jackson forward. Okay, you got it. Okay, all right. So Sherry, is it your desire to identify with Jesus that Jesus died for you and rose again for you through your baptism? If so, say I do. I do.
Let's pray. Oh, Father God, we are so grateful. We're grateful for Randy. We are grateful for Bryce. We are grateful for Bob. We are grateful for Sherry. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for working in each one of their lives. Thank you for the testimony that we heard. Thank you for the work of the gospel in their lives. And God, we pray your blessing on each one of them. Help them to continue to grow and deepen in their faith and that they would just serve and follow you. Thank you for the people they mentioned that touched their lives for you. And there were many. And Lord, may you use all of us to show the love of Christ to point people to the gospel. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.